Oliver had been to the works to be mended. Some troublesome cars tricked him, and the Great Western engine fell into the turntable well. Now Oliver was as good as new, but he was still worried about cars. I'd rather not use them, he puffed to himself. But the cars sang songs rude and loud. Scruffy, their leader, led the chorus. Oliver's no use at all, thinks he's very clever. Says that he can manage us, that's the best joke ever. When he orders us about with the greatest folly, we just push him down the well. Pop goes all Ollie. Thomas, Duck, and Percy were shocked. Be quiet, they ordered. But they couldn't be everywhere, and everywhere they weren't, the cars began again. Oliver's no use at all, thinks he's very clever. Says that he can manage us, that's the best joke ever. At last, the engines gave up. We're sorry, Oliver, they said. It's really my fault, said Oliver sadly. I shouldn't have fallen in the turntable well. Toad, the brake van, felt sorry for Oliver too. Next morning, he spoke to Douglas. I'm worried, Mr. Douglas. This disrespect for engines. Where is it going to end? Who knows, sighed Douglas. I've got a plan, Mr. Douglas. May I stay here today and help Mr. Oliver? We are both Great Western and must stand together. Certainly, Toad, replied Douglas and puffed away. Soon, Toad was explaining his plan. Goodness gracious, Toad, I don't think you should suggest such a thing to Oliver. But Oliver interrupted. No, Duck, Toad's right. It's really my fault. I must put this trouble right. I meant no disrespect, you understand. Of course not, Toad. Anyway, Driver says the same, and he's arranged it with the station master. Very well, Oliver, conceded Duck. But I must hurry. My passengers will be waiting. Good luck. So long, smiled Oliver bravely, but he felt dreadfully nervous inside. Oliver marshaled the worst cars two by two. That's the way, Mr. Oliver, whispered Toad. And if you leave that scruffy to last, then you'll have him behind you, and you can bump him if he starts his nonsense. Hold back, hold back, whispered Scruffy, and pass the word to the others. The silly cars giggled. But Oliver knew what to do. There was plenty of sand on the rails, and his wheels gripped splendidly. He gave a great heave. Oh, groaned Scruffy. I don't like this. Go on, yelled Duck. Well done, boy, well done. Oh, well, Scruffy. I'm coming apart. And he did. Then there was trouble. Well, Oliver, so you don't know your own strength, is that it? N no, no, sir, said, said Oliver nervously. So Topham had inspected Scruffy. As I thought. Rotten wood, rusty frames. Maybe if we put you back together, you'll earn yourself a better name. Nowadays, Oliver only takes the cars when the other engines are busy. But they're always quick to warn each other. Take care with Mr. Oliver. If you play tricks on him, you'll never be the same car again. Scruffy has learned his lesson and says nothing at all. Bertie the bus was giving some visitors a tour of the island of Soda. It was their last afternoon and Edward was preparing to take them to meet Bill and Ben. He found it hard to start the heavy train. Did you see him straining? asked Henry. Positively painful, remarked James. Just pathetic. 
grunted Gordon. He should give up and be preserved before it's too late. Shut up, burst out Duck. You're all jealous. Edward's better than any of you. You're right, Duck, said Boko. Edward's old, but he'll surprise us all. I've done it. We're off. I've done it. We're off, said Edward, as he finally puffed out of the station. Bill and Ben were delighted to see the visitors. They loved being photographed. Later, they took the party to the China Clay Works in a brake van special. Everyone had a splendid time, and the visitors were most impressed. Then Edward took the visitors home. On the way, the weather changed. Wind and rain buffeted Edward. His sanding gear failed, and his fireman rode in front, dropping sand on the rails by hand. Suddenly, Edward's wheels slipped fiercely, and with a shrieking crack, something broke. The crew inspected the damage. Repairs took some time. One of your crank pins broke, Edward, said his driver. We've taken your side rods off. Now you're like an old-fashioned engine. Can you get these people home? They must start back tonight. I'll try, sir, promised Edward. Edward puffed and pulled his hardest, but his wheels kept slipping and he could not start the heavy train. The passengers were anxious. The driver, fireman, and conductor went along the train, making adjustments between the coaches. We've loosened the couplings, Edward. Now you can pick up your coaches one by one, just as you do with freight cars. That'll be much easier, said Edward. Come on, he puffed and moved cautiously forward. The first coach moving helped to start the second, and the second helped the third. I've done it! I've done it! puffed Edward. Steady, boy, warned his driver. Well done, boy! You've got them! You've got them! And he listened happily to Edward's steady beat as he forged slowly but surely ahead. At last, battered, weary, but unbeaten, Edward steamed in. Henry was waiting for the visitors with the special train. Beep! Beep! Sir Topham Hatt angrily pointed to the clock, but excited passengers cheered and thanked Edward, his driver and fireman. Duck and Boko saw to it that Edward was left in peace. Gordon and James remained respectfully silent. Stepney's visit to the Fat Controller's Railway was coming to an end. We shall miss you, said the Fat Controller. Then he turned his attention to all the other engines. My railway is very busy and I am pleased with you, but you need help. A diesel is all that's available. Please do your best to avoid any, er, uh, disturbances. What does that mean? whispered Duck. That means this diesel is difficult, snapped James. And he was. The diesel surveyed the shed. Not bad, I've seen worse. At least you're all clean, he sneered. The engines glared. It's not your fault, but your controller should scrap you and get engines like me. A fill of oil, a touch on the starter, and I'm off. No bother, no waiting. They have to fuss around you for hours before you're ready. 
the engines were furious. Next morning, they held an indignation meeting round the turntable. Disgraceful, mumbled Gordon. Disgusting, said James. Despicable, spluttered Henry. To say such things to us, cried Donald and Douglas. It's to teach him a lesson we'd be wanting. Now how do we do it? But a chance came sooner than expected. The diesel was purring comfortably. An inspector watched the fitter making final adjustments. The wind tugged at the inspector's hat. The diesel was ready. Look at me, Doc and Stepney. Now I'll show you something. He rolled proudly towards his coaches. Then it happened. Shaking and spluttering, the diesel stopped. Meanwhile, the inspector was looking for his hat. The diesel seethed with fury as Duck and Stepney pushed him back to the shed. My hat! exclaimed the inspector. You've sucked it through your air intake. Bother your hat, said the fat controller. The heavy train's due out. You'll have to take it, Doc. Stepney, will you help, please? Thank you, sir, cried Stepney. I'd like a good long run on my last day. The engines were soon ready. Gordon will take over from halfway, so get the train there. Good luck. Don't worry, smiled Stepney. We'll get there and be early, too. The cavalcade moved carefully over the rails and out to the open line. Now for a sprint, puffed Stepney. I'm ready when you are, replied Duck. Soon they were whizzing through Edward Station. And next, they charged at Gordon's Hill beyond. They felt the drag of the heavy coaches here. It was hard work. At last, they were running smoothly along the line towards the big station. Hello, said Gordon. You're early. That's one in the headlamp for old diesel. James says he's sick as boiler sludge and sulking in the shed. Serves him right for saying we're out of date. And Gordon chortled away. Next day, everyone came to say goodbye to Stepney. Come back and see us soon, whistled the engines. And you are always welcome on my Bluebell Railway too, replied Stepney. Then he puffed away. And what about Diesel? He'd slipped out whilst no one was looking. He said goodbye to no one but left two things behind. A rather nasty smell and a battered bowler hat. Toby and Henrietta were enjoying their new job on the island of Sodor. But they do look old-fashioned and did need new paint. James was very rude whenever he saw them. Yuck! What dirty objects, he would say. At last, Toby lost patience. James, he asked, why are you red? I am a splendid engine, answered James, ready for anything. You never see my paint dirty. Oh, said Toby innocently, that's why you once needed bootlaces, to be ready, I suppose. James went redder than ever and snorted off. It was such an insult to be reminded of the time a bootlace had been used to mend a hole in his coaches. At the end of the line, James left his coaches and got ready for his next train. It was a slow freight, stopping at every station to pick up and set down cars. James hated slow freight trains. Dirty cars from dirty siding. Yeah!
starting with only a few, he picked up more and more cars at each station till he had a long train. At first, the freight cars behaved well, but James bumped them so crossly that they were determined to get back at him. Presently, they approached the top of Gordon's Hill. Heavy freight trains halt here to set their brakes. James had had an accident with cars before and should have remembered this. Wait, James, wait, said the driver, but James wouldn't wait. He was too busy thinking what he would say to Toby when they next met. The freight car's chance had come. Hurrah, hurrah, they laughed, and banging their buffers, they pushed him down the hill. On, on, yelled the cars. I've got to stop, I've got to stop grown James. Disaster lay ahead. Something sticky splashed all over James. He had run into two tar wagons and was black from smoke box to cad. He was more dirty than hurt. But the tar wagons and some cars were all to pieces. Toby and Percy were sent to help and came as quickly as they could. Look here, Percy, exclaimed Toby. Whatever is that dirty object? That's James, didn't you know? It's James's shape, said Toby. But James is a splendid red engine, and you never see his paint dirty. James pretended he hadn't heard. <laughs> Toby and Percy cleared away the unhurt cars and helped James home. Sir Topham Hatt met them. Well done, Percy and Toby. He turned to James. Fancy letting your cars run away. I am surprised. You're not fit to be seen. You must be cleaned at once. Toby shall have a new coat of paint. Please, sir, can Henrietta have one too? Said Toby. Certainly, Toby. Oh, thank you, sir. She will be pleased. All James could do was watch Toby as he ran off happily with the news. Sir Handel had been naughty, so Sir Topham Hatt made him stay in the shed for a while. Peter Sam was now busier than ever. He had to do Sir Handel's work as well as his own. He was very excited, and the firemen found him hard to handle. <clears throat> Anyone would think that he wanted to work said Sir Handel, who was lonely and bored. All respectable engines do, replied Scarloe. Keep calm, Peter Sam, and you'll do well. But Peter Sam was in such a state that he couldn't listen. He collected some coaches and went on his way. But somehow, the faster he wanted to go, the slower the journey became. When Peter Sam finally fussed into the station, Henry was already there. This won't do, youngster, said Henry. I can't be kept waiting. If you are late tonight, I'll go off and leave your passengers behind. <laughs> said Peter Sam. Secretly, he was a little worried, but not for long. The conductor blew his whistle and waved his green flag. Peter Sam puffed happily away, singing a little song. I'm Peter Sam, I'm running this line. I'm Peter Sam, I'm running this line. What fun it all is, he thought, as he journeyed along the line. Coaches enjoyed themselves too, 
they were growing fond of Peter Sam. Every afternoon, they had to wait an hour at the station by the lake. The station has a little shop selling refreshments. The conductor, fireman, and the guard buy tea and cakes from the refreshment lady. At last, the waiting was over, and Peter Sam was sizzling with impatience. Beep, beep, hurry up, please, he whistled to the passengers. How awful, he thought, if we miss Henry's train. The conductor was ready with his flag and whistle. The refreshment lady was making her way to the train. Then it happened. The conductor says that Peter Sam was too impatient. Peter Sam says he was sure he heard a whistle. Anyway, he started. Stop, 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 wailed the coaches. You've left the refreshment lady behind. Bother, groaned Peter Sam. We're sure to miss Henry now. The refreshment lady climbed aboard and they started again. Peter Sam didn't sing anymore. Instead, he hurried along the line as fast as his wheels and his driver would let him. They arrived at the big station just in time. Hurrah, said Peter Sam. He felt very relieved. Not bad, youngster, said Henry loftily, but the refreshment lady was still cross. What do you mean by leaving me behind? I'm sorry, refreshment lady, replied Peter Sam, but Henry said he might leave without us. Then the refreshment lady laughed. You silly engine! Henry was teasing you! He wouldn't have gone without our passengers. He's a guaranteed connection. Well, said Peter Sam, where's that Henry? But Henry had chortled away. Every summer, the island of Sodor is very busy. Holidaymakers love to sightsee. When the weather is fine, there is no better place to visit. Some people like to go to the mountains. Others like the valleys. Children love the seaside. One morning, Thomas was puffing along the line that runs by the coast. His two coaches, Annie and Clarabelle, were packed with children going to the beach. Everyone was happy. Percy was taking some freight cars to the harbor. Hello, Thomas. You look cheerful. I wish I could take children today instead of freight cars. They're the Vicar's Sunday School, explained Thomas. I'm busy this evening, but the station master says I can ask you to take the children home. Of course I will, promised Percy. Later, Percy saw Harold. Sorry, Percy. Can't talk. I'm on high alert. Why? Bad weather's due. My help's always needed. Mind how you go, Percy. <laughs> Huffed Percy. As long as I've got rails to run on, I can go anywhere, in any weather, anyhow. Goodbye. Be careful, warned Edward. There's a storm coming. A promise is a promise, thought Percy, no matter what the weather. The children had a lovely day, but by tea time, dark clouds loomed ahead. Annie and Clarabelle were glad when Percy arrived. He was just in time. The rain streamed down Percy's boiler. Ugh, he shivered and thought of his nice dry shed. Percy struggled on past coastal villages and into the countryside. The river was rising fast. I wish I could see, I wish I could see, complained Percy as he battled against the rain. More trouble lay ahead. Oh, 
Mr. Percy. The water is sloshing my fire. Percy's driver and fireman had to find some more firewood. I'll have some of your floorboards, please, said the fireman to the conductor. I only swept the floor this morning, grumbled the conductor, but he still helped. Soon, Percy's fire was burning well. He felt warm and comfortable again. Then he saw Harold. Oh, dear, thought Percy. Harold's come to laugh at me. Something thudded onto Percy's boiler. Ow, exclaimed Percy. He needn't throw things. It's a parachute, laughed his driver. Harold's dropping hot drinks for us. Thank you, Harold, whistled Percy. Good to be of service, replied Harold and buzzed away. The water lapped Percy's wheels. Percy was losing steam again, but he plunged bravely on. I promised, he panted. I promised. He made one more big effort, and at last, exhausted but triumphant, he brought the train home. Well done, Percy, cheered Thomas. You kept your promise, despite everything. Sir Topham had arrived in Harold. First he thanked the men, then Percy. Harold told me you were uh, a wizard. He said he can beat you at some things, but not at being a submarine. I don't know what you two get up to sometimes, but I do know that you're a really useful engine. Oh, sir, whispered Percy happily. <laughs> Shining, it's a lovely day. It won't be long before we're on our way. The guard is waiting, flag in hand. He blows his whistle, we're off to see him sand. The sky is blue, there's not a cloud in sight. So much excitement, didn't sleep all night. Now Percy's washing through the countryside. To the seaside Ice cream and cones Candy floss on your nose Seaside We're off to the seaside We're gonna have a lovely day Just one more hill to climb And we'll be there Sounds of the seaside Start to fill the air Then someone shouts out Excitedly Seaside Buckets and spades All the fair down our gaze Seaside We're off to the seaside We're gonna have a lovely day And when it's cold In winter time Still you can be there Anytime Just close your eyes Count one Dream and once again be by the sea Sir Topham had arrived to greet the train He's so pleased that Percy's right on time So much excitement, so much glee We're all together with Percy by the sea Seaside, we're all at the seaside Buildings and castles with buckets and spades Seaside, we're all at the seaside Oh, what a lovely, lovely day Such a lovely day